Now, let's talk a little bit about what happened on that day of atonement. We need to understand that the heavenly sanctuary is the great original from whence the earthly sanctuary was modeled after. And what happened on the Day of Atonement in the earthly sanctuary that will help us understand what happened on October 22nd, the Day of Atonement, the 10th day of the 7th month, in 1844 at the end of the 2300 days. What happened? Yes. It was a cleansing of the sanctuary. We get that from Leviticus 16. But what happened that day? Remember, all the feasts, you have to focus on Jesus. And when you focus on Jesus, then you understand the feasts. Just like we did with Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits and Pentecost. All right? And again, with the trumpets, it is Jesus that sends those warnings to the world. It is Jesus waking up the world to the fulfillment of prophecy. He's the one blowing those trumpets. It comes from the throne of God. And if you look at the blowing of the trumpets, in the book of Revelation, they all come out of the temple. Amen. Every one of those angels that blow the trumpet, they come out of the temple in heaven. So you need to focus on that heavenly temple and the work of Jesus in that temple to see the fulfillment even of the trumpets and of the Day of Atonement. So in the Day of Atonement, we need to focus on the high priest. What happened in that day? Yes, it was the only time throughout the year where the holy and the highest priest would go beyond the veil into the most holy place. Now, did that actually happen in heaven? Was it a change in the ministry of Christ or was it an actual change in geography in heaven? Because we've heard a lot about, yeah, they prefigure the work of Jesus, but uh, is there a real sanctuary in heaven? How would you prove that from the Word of God? Hebrews 8 and 9. Yes, we, we can read a couple of texts there. Hebrews 8 and 9, and we need to know these things, you know. Um, the Apostle Peter tells us that we need to be confirmed in the present truth, even though we know these things. And it's good for us to go over them because we are going to be put to the test on these very things. Hebrews chapter 8. For many of us, these are very familiar texts, but there's always new people that haven't heard these things, and we need to learn them and teach them. Hebrews 8, verse 4, For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. But those priests serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, said he, that thou makest all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So the heavenly tabernacle was the pattern, the model the original 
from which the one on earth was patterned. And it says in verse 1, For we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So is there a sanctuary, a tabernacle in heaven? My Bible says that Christ is the minister of that sanctuary, that true tabernacle which was pitched by God himself. We call it the heavenly sanctuary, the true tabernacle. We also call it the heavenly temple or the temple which is in heaven. Now, many people say, well, all of heaven is God's temple. Let's read what the Bible says. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11, 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. The temple of God was open in heaven. So where is God's temple? It doesn't say that heaven is the temple. It says that the temple of God was opened in heaven. Again, chapter 15. And I looked, verse 5, and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. So is there a temple in heaven? Amen. Does it have a holy and a most holy place? Amen. Well, if you read the book of Revelation, everything happens around that temple. And you see the seven candlesticks. You see the altar of incense, the golden altar. You find every piece of the furniture of the sanctuary on earth with its reality in heaven. Even the Ark of the Covenant is seen in heaven when the temple was opened. What happened in October 22nd, 1844. Yes, let me read you a very beautiful text here from Patriarchs and Prophets 370. The heavenly temple, the abiding place of the King of Kings, where thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stand before him, that temple filled with the glory of the eternal throne, where seraphim, its shining guardians, veil their faces in adoration, no earthly structure could represent its vastness and its glory. Now you see, whenever we think of the temple in heaven, we always want to think about the heavenly temple as we know it from the earthly. It says here that there is no way, there is no earthly structure that could represent the vastness or the glory of the heavenly temple. What does the word vastness mean? Huge, large. Are you aware that that temple is so huge that it takes a chariot to go from the holy to the most <laughs> holy place? <laughs> and don't even laugh because it's true. It is that vast, that great. 
Well, let me read it to you. I think it's in early writings. <laughs> it holds thousands, thousands, and thousands, <laughs> times thousands. Let's see. I saw the Father, page 55 of early writings. I saw the Father rise from his throne, and in a flaming chariot, go into the Holy of Holies within the veil, and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne, and the most of those who were bowed down arose with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he arose, arose, and they were left in perfect darkness. Those who arose when Jesus did kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them out. He raised, then he raised his right arm, and we heard his lovely voice saying, Wait here, I'm going to my father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless, and in a little while I will return from the wedding and receive you unto myself. Then I saw a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire surrounded by angels who came, which came to where Jesus was. He stepped up into the chariot and was born to the holiest where the Father was sitting down. And I beheld Jesus, our great high priest, standing before the Father. On the hem of his garment was a belt and a pomegranate, a belt and a pomegranate. Those who rose up with Jesus would send up their faith to him in the holiest and pray, My Father, give us thy spirit. Then Jesus would, would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost. In that breath was light, power, and much love, joy, and peace. I turned to look to the company who were still bowed before the throne in the holy place. They did not know Jesus had left. And then I saw Satan appear to be by the throne, trying to carry on the work of God. And I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. And in it there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. Let me ask you, did this just happen back in 1844 or is it happening today? Those that do not follow Jesus into the Holy of Holies, those that do not keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, they bow down to the throne. And week after week, they bring their prayers and adoration to the throne. But who is by that throne? Mm. And they think that they're receiving the Holy Ghost. And what are they receiving? The influence of Satan. Could that be happening even in the Adventist church today? Yes. <laughs> That's only because they took their eyes away from Jesus. Amen. They forgot the day of atonement. 
And you see, when you don't remember the Day of Atonement, that's what happens. You are worshiping a wrong spirit. You are praying to the wrong throne. Jesus is no longer in the holy place. He's gone on to the most holy place. And those that do not understand this and by faith go into the most holy of holies, they will be deceived by Satan. They are being deceived. And they will get a lot of power, it says here, light and power, but no joy and love and peace. There is no peace outside of Jesus. There's no peace outside of the Holy of Holies. And that's where we need to come on a daily basis. Now, I know that there is a fulfillment of all the feasts in the end time. And we need to study that. But we never should forget that today we are living in the Day of Atonement. We might be celebrating unleavened bread today. But in God's timetable, this is the Day of Atonement. Do we understand that? Is there a contradiction? No. No. Ever since 1844, when the judgment began, the faith of Christ's ministry represented through the sanctuary and the feast is the Day of Atonement. And if we on a daily basis come to the sanctuary, to the most holy place through Jesus, and keep our eyes fixed on him, we will receive the Holy Ghost when he sends that from heaven. Now, what happens in the most holy place? You know, if we walk in there, we need to see what's going on. Why is it so important for us to understand the feasts and especially the Day of Atonement? What happens there? Mm, the blotting out of sins? Well, isn't that done every day when I confess my sin? Huh. Hasn't Jesus been forgiven our sins ever since he went up to heaven? Thus forgiven... And blotting out, is that the same thing? No. Where do you learn that it's not the same thing? In the sanctuary. This is why we as people need to go back and study the sanctuary. Because that's where we learn all these things. Just like the daily service would take away the weight of sin from the sinner and transpose that into the sanctuary through the blood. The sinner would be forgiven on a daily basis, but it was not until the day of atonement that the sanctuary was cleansed of that sin, that the blotting out of that sin happened. And that was on the 10th day of the seventh month. Through the blood, the sin was transferred to the sanctuary. But in the day of atonement, the sanctuary was cleansed. How does that affect us today? Is it important for us to understand this? Isn't it enough that we know that if we confess our sins, he forgives us? What is the thing about the heavenly sanctuary, the most holy place, that we need to understand the most? Purification. Okay? 
Let's go back to Leviticus 16. You know, it is a passion play, the whole chapter. We don't have the time to read it tonight. In fact, I'm just about done with my time. <laughs> I think we're going to have to uh, take it from here tomorrow. But let me read you verse 16. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so ha shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. Uncleanness. Let me ask you, what was it that, uh, that made the sanctuary unclean it says here because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel their transgressions and their sins how could the sanctuary the tabernacle be made unclean wasn't it through the blood that carried the sin and the cleansing of the sanctuary meant to take away that sin from the sanctuary. Where was it taken to? The scapegoat. Could it be done without blood? Because without blood, there is no remission of sin. So again the priest would take that blood and sprinkle it in the mercy seat and then we, he would come out carrying those sins and put it on the scapegoat. Tomorrow we, we, we will go into that whole passion place so that we understand exactly what goes on in heaven today. But it says at the end of chapter 16, verse 33, and he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priest, and for all the people of the congregation, and this shall be an everlasting statue unto you, to make an atonement for the children of Israel, for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. So this final atonement that was made once a year represents the final atonement of Jesus in the most holy place. The cleansing of the sanctuary has to do not only with the records in heaven. Through the judgment, The records in heaven are cleansed. But did you hear well when I read early writings that said, wait for a little while, I'm going to go and receive a what? A kingdom. Wait until I come back from what? from the wedding. Here are two imageries that we need to dwell upon as we study on the Day of Atonement. Because you find it in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. You see Christ being brought forth before the ancient of days. This is Daniel chapter 7. And then we will read, what is it, verse 
12, right? Or verse 13. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. And all the people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion and everlasting dom is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which will not be destroyed. So he comes before the ancient of man, he's brought before him, and is given unto him a kingdom and dominion. There you have the receiving of the kingdom. We will see tomorrow what that means. And then what was the other imagery that we read in Ellen White? The wedding. Where do you find that in Scripture? You find it in Revelation. You find it in the Gospels. You find it in the teachings of Jesus. He's the one that says, Be ye like men who await for his Lord to return from the wedding. We will go into that tomorrow because there is very special truth that needs to be learned from us as we study on the Day of Atonement, the meaning and why it is so important for us to go beyond the veil, to go into the most holy and understand what is happening there. Just as much as the Lord Jesus, our high priest, is making the final atonement for the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, there is a work of cleansing that needs to take place where? On earth. On what temple? This temple. The soul temple. And if those two don't work together, it's useless. You can study about the feasts. You can know all about them. But if you don't allow the high priest to cleanse that temple of your soul, then even knowing of the feast won't help you. It has to do with the actual work of Jesus in the most holy place. And that we will start tomorrow. As we dwell upon what happened on that Day of Atonement, I want you to picture the scene. I want you to see that heavenly temple, that vast, immense temple. I don't know if we can ever picture that. And I'm going to read that text again to end there, Daniel chapter 7. And I beheld till thrones were set down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garments was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and the wheels of his throne as burning fire. Now this is a living throne, isn't it? What are the wheels of the throne? Yes. Go back tonight and before you go to, uh, to bed, look up Ezekiel chapter 1 and read there, or Ezekiel chapter 10, and you will read about the wheels. Yes, they are actual living beings. A wheel inside a wheel, and they move. And when they move, they can go forward and backward and sideways, and they don't have to turn. They're living beings. Now, the next verse says, And a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. What is that fiery stream? From the mercy seat, which is the throne of God, comes forth a river of fire. Have you ever pictured the heavenly sanctuary as a huge, 
building. The throne is in the most holy place, but there is a river, a stream of fire. What is that? Could be a symbol of the Holy Spirit, but he's represented by the seven candlesticks. A fire is a symbol of purification, yes. But why a fiery fire? John, I mean, uh, Daniel saw it. He saw from the throne, springing from the throne, a river of fire. What is that? It's literal. It's not symbolic. It's literal. You say there's a fiery stream. Well, read. It, it says right there what it is. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. And then you have two dots. That means here's what it is. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. That fiery fire, that stream of fire, is millions of angels that serve and wait before the throne of God. God maketh his ministers a flame, a fire, Hebrews 1 7. The angels that wait upon the Lord in the heavenly sanctuary, they are like fire because they shine so much. It was the only thing back then that Daniel con could compare that. They didn't have light like we do today. The brightest thing he could compare that would, would be to fire. But they move. That's why it's like a moving stream, like water that are in constant movement. The angels that way before the Lord in the heavenly court, they are like fire. Did you know what he called them? Ellen White said, seraphims. Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on his throne high in his temple. And the garment of God was light and it filled the temple with his glory. It's light. So picture that temple. It's so vast, so huge, that you, it can hold millions and millions of angels. Amen. Just imagine that, how big it is. There's nothing on earth that could compare to that. Absolutely nothing where you can actually fit millions of people inside that temple. And then... Like we said before, you need a chariot with wheels to move from the holy to the most holy place. Actually, Jesus got on that chariot of fire and he was transported. The wheels turned, their angels, and they moved on and then the doors were open and the Ark of the Covenant was inside. And God himself, the Father, was sitting on top of his law. Amen. And millions of angels were before him. The judge sat down and the books were opened. We need to come before the judgment scene. Ellen White says that we ought to do this daily. So you need to picture that sanctuary in heaven, the heavenly temple. Every day we need to see this scene because if we don't come and understand what is happening in there, why the whole host of angels is before God, what is happening in that judgment, the investigative judgment? What is the cleansing of the sanctuary we will not be ready for the seal of the living God. And when that judgment is ended, every 
case will be sealed. Every case will be decided. The wedding will be over. The kingdom will have been received. And I want to be a citizen of that kingdom. Amen. I want to be included in that wedding reception, yes, but I want to be a part of that marriage. Because when the judgment is over, the marriage is over. And only those that by faith await the Lord when He returns from the wedding will be able to go into the wedding feast. We will speak about that tomorrow. Shall we ask the Lord tonight to give us that glimpse of the investigative judgment and the court in heaven and the work that needs to be done on earth in our lives that we may be ready to receive the seal of the living God? I ask you tonight, is the scene of the heavenly court and the judgment in heaven so fresh in your mind as if you were the only one on earth who would come before the court? The judge is sitting down and your name and my name will be called. We need to understand that when this happens, our lives must be cleansed of all sin and iniquity. We must transfer those sins beforehand into the judgment. Send them beforehand so that when our name is called, we will be cleansed and sealed forever through that final atonement that Jesus is doing in the Holy of Holies.